Hello everyone and welcome again to Nettle, the best platform around for distance learning in business, finance, economics and much much more. My name is Sava and today we are continuing our discussion of heteroscedasticity tests, that is statistical procedures that one can apply to determine whether there are any dependencies in the variance of the disturbance terms of your regressions that violate the Gauss Markov assumptions and lead to your estimators being inefficient and increasing the likelihood of a type 2 error. In the previous videos we discussed the two simplest heteroscedasticity tests, that is the bruch pagan test and the goldfield quant test, and what advantages and limitations do they have. Today we are discussing some of the other tests that have been developed later that tackle some of the limitations of the bruch pagan test mostly. Well, for the bruch pagan test, as you remember, we regressed the squared residual onto the initial regressors in the starting model, and uh, by applying the f-test or the chi-squared test to the explanatory power of the auxiliary regression, we were able to derive the p-values for the uh, probability that there is no heteroscedasticity in the data. And uh, one might ask, why squared residual? Why can't there be another functional form that would relate the dependencies of the variance of the disturbance terms to the initial regressors? And that's exactly what are two other prominent tests, that is the Harvey test and the Gleiser test, account for. For the Harvey test, instead of having the squared residual, you apply the log squared residual, so the natural logarithm of the squared residual as the dependent variable of the auxiliary regression. And for the Glazer test, you use the absolute value of the residual uh, as the dependent variable of the auxiliary regression. Those allow to obtain a richer picture of the properties of your heteroscedasticity and uh, eliminate all uh, relevant possibilities of your functional form of the dependence of the variance of the disturbance term on your initial regressors. So without further ado, let's calculate the relevant dependent variables for the Harvey and Gleiser uh, auxiliary regressions and apply those and determine whether the functional form matters for the heteroscedasticity in our case. So for the Harvey test, we need the natural log of the squared residual, and as we already have the squared residual that we used for the bruch pagan test, we can just calculate the natural logarithm of this cell and bottom right click it all the way down and get um, the natural logarithm of the squared residual. And for the Gleiser test, we just need to apply the abs function, which is the absolute value, and apply it to the residual, not the squared residual, as again, squared residual is already non-negative, but to the actual residual. We have calculated by subtracting the expected value of the Tesla return from the actual value of the Tesla return, the realized return. So the absolute value of the residual would be the dependent variable for the Gleiser auxiliary regression. So let's apply those two tests just now and select again a three by five array, apply Linus, select the relevant uh, dependent variable. In case of the Harvey test, it would be the log squared residual. And the independent variables would always stay the same. They're gonna be the oil return and the S&P 100 return. And we always need to include the constant and the additional statistics for our Linus regression. And then we enforce this formula using shift control enter and get our regression output. Again, we're not concerned with uh, the coefficients per se. We just need the respective uh, f-stats and chi-squared stats to convert them into p-values that would tell us what is the probability that there is no autocorrelation in the data as per the assumed functional form. So the f-stat, again, we could have just taken it from here, but to double check, we can again divide the r-squared by one minus r-squared, multiply by the number of the degrees of freedom, in the auxiliary regression and divide by the number of independent variables, that is by two, and we get exactly the same value as reported here. And then to convert it into a p-value, we can apply the 
fdist right tail function, uh, get the fstat, and as the first input into the degrees of freedom, again, we have two, the number of explanatory variables, and the second number of the degrees of freedom is the number of the degrees of freedom in the auxiliary regression. And we get 66.21%, which is slightly lower, but comparable to the values we got from the bruch pagan test and from the Caulfield quant test, which means that um, this um, hydroskedasticity structure is deemed more likely than the ones we uh, examined before, but it's still reasonably unlikely that the uh, errors of the regressions are heteroskedastic, and uh, homoskedasticity is extremely likely at 66% or even higher. For the chi-squared stat, we need to multiply the r-squared by the number of observations, that is 1,258. We get 0 0.8263, and then uh, to convert it into a p-value, we need to apply the chi-squared dist right-tailed and input the statistic and 2 as the number of the degrees of freedom and get a very similar p-value. Again, those two tests are practically equivalent for most purposes, but it's usually asserted that the chi-squared tests are more reliable in most of the cases. So please do report either both tests or the chi-squared tests for your bruch pagan Harvey, or Gleiser test. And as for the Gleiser test, we just need to apply the same procedure to the absolute residuals. So we again select our Linus array, we apply the Linus function and select the appropriate dependent variable, the absolute residuals in that case, and our explanatory variables always stay the same, OLN and S&P 500 returns. We need the constant, we need the statistics, and press shift control enter. And here we can just be a little bit lazy as the number of the degrees of freedom is the same, as the dimension of our regression model is the same, we can just copy this across and it will calculate the fstat and the p-value um, in exactly the same manner. And for the chi-squared stat, it's again going to be exactly the same and we'll get very similar p-values to our bruch pagan test. Uh, what can we infer from this output for Harvey test and for the Gleiser test? Well, we can uh, reasonably, um, we can with reasonable certainty assume that uh, none of the three functional form, neither squared residuals, absolute residuals, or log squared residuals, signal at any presence of heteroscedasticity. But if one would have to choose the most likely um, property of um, your heteroscedasticity would be the log squared residuals as the Harvey test returns the lowest p-value. But that's not the end of the story, as there is another test that is reasonably more sophisticated than the bruch pagan harvey or Gleiser test, and it is the White test that has been suggested by uh, White in uh, the 1980s. Uh, so for the White test, you have to, again, regress the squared residual just as in bruch pagan test, but your set of explanatory variables is expanded. Uh, White suggested regressing the uh, variance of the error term not only on the initial regressors, but also on their squares and their cross products. So we also would not need to regress on S&P 500 return squared, on oil return squared, and on the product. So oil return times S&P 500 return. And we have pretty much everything prepared for this procedure. So here we can just multiply the oil return by the S&P 500 return and bottom right click it all the way down. Here we can square the oil return and bottom right click it all the way down. And here we can square the S&P 500 return and again bottom right click it all the way down. And in that case we'll have more regresses. So the number of the degrees of freedom in our F test or the chi squared test would be higher, but the logic stays ultimately the same. We need to select our Linus array, here it would be 6 by 5, as we have 5 regresses and a constant, 5 because we have 2 initial regresses, 2 of their squares, and 1 additional cross product. If we had 3 regresses, for example, we would need to add 3 cross products, 
pairwise. For example, if we added, for example, Dow Jones, we would need to multiply oil times S&P, oil times Dow Jones, and S&P times Dow Jones. So that would be three. And this number would actually explode as you increase the number of regressors. So the more regressors you include, the more is the degrees of freedom reduction the white test presumes. So now we can uh, enforce the Linus function. Our uh, dependent variable will be the squared residual, just as in case of the bruce pagan test. But our set of explanatory variables will be much larger. We'll start with oil return and go all the way through their cross product of oil and S&P 500 return to their squares as well. And we'll include five columns as our set of explanatory variables. We we'll also need to add a constant and report additional statistics, close the parentheses and press shift control enter. And now we can still apply the F test and the chi squared test to determine whether the white test have detected any heteroscedasticity prior test failed to. So for that F stat, we can just divide the R squared again by 1 minus R squared, multiply it by the number of the degrees of freedom, and divide by the number of regressors in the auxiliary regression. And here it will be not 2, but 5, as we also included the cross product and the squares. So we enforce this formula and converting it into the P value, converting the F stat into the P value, we can apply the right tailed F distribution, uh, inputting the value of the f stat our first uh, number of the degrees of freedom is going to be five the number of explanatory variables and the second will be 1252 the number of the degrees of freedom in the auxiliary regression and we enforce this formula and get 77 percent even higher than in the case of bruce pagan test or uh gothel quant test that means that white test ultimately doesn't provide any new valuable insight into the heteroscedasticity structure of this particular data set just to be on the safe side, let's compute the chi-squared stat as well, multiplying the r-squared by uh, 1258, the total number of observations, and calculating the p-value using the right-tailed chi-squared distribution with five degrees of freedom, again, number of factors in the auxiliary regression. And we get a very similar p-value of 77.19%. So... Uh, there are many heteroscedasticity tests that can be applied from bruce Bagan that we investigated in the very first video to various modifications of this logic of auxiliary regressions as heteroscedasticity test. So from Harvey test that uses log squared residuals instead of plain squared residuals to Gleiser test that uses just absolute residuals. Or you can go another way and expand the set of potential explanatory variables by including the squares of the initial regressors and their cross products and that would give you the white test sometimes one of those four tests will give you the a significant p-value that will alarm you that heteroscedasticity is present if you assume a particular functional form so you need to trust the test that gives you the lowest p-value here as all of those use particular assumptions uh, regarding the functional form but in our case, the results have been incredibly similar, so we might assume that there is no heteroscedasticity at all, and we should rest our case here, but actually it's not the end of the story. In the next video, we will discuss the most commonly applied heteroscedasticity test in case of financial time series, the Arsh model, and discuss its advantages over all of its counterparts that we have applied right now. Again, just to remind you, the tests that we used um, so far, so Bruce Bagan, Harvey, Gleiser, White, and Goldfeld Quant, are extremely useful to assess heteroscedasticity in cross-sectional data or panel data, but for financial time series, heteroscedasticity is its own thing, and that's where Arsh test that we're going to discuss in the next video comes in handy. As for now, that's all we have for Harvey, Gleiser, and White test. Please leave a like under this video if you found it helpful. In the comments below, I will be eager to see any suggestions for further videos on business economics or finance. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Thank you very much and stay tuned.